Right, well, welcome back. Uh, I hope everybody enjoyed their lunches, and welcome back to what promises to be, I hope, another very interesting panel discussion. My name is Stephen Adams. I am the Senior Director at the Political and Regulatory Risk Due Diligence Business Global Council. Um, I'm particularly interested, and we are a, a proud supporter of today's event, I'm particularly interested in this panel because one of the things that the GC does a lot of work on is due diligence on supply chain design, and it seems to me that this question of the interrelationship between the development of uh, CBDCs or their analogies and the question of something as fundamental of how, as how we pay for cross-border trade, how we invoice in international trade, is something that's only just starting to impinge on the consciousness uh, of the men and women that we work for. Um, they don't think very much about what goes on in rooms like this, discussions like this, and they need to think about it a lot more. And in some ways, at least, that's the, the, the subject of our next discussion. Um, I have a fantastic panel. Uh, many of you probably already know uh, Usmani Manding, Michael Lloyd, and Diego Balon Osio. I'm not going to introduce them. What I'm going to ask them to do essentially is to introduce themselves by talking about their work. Um, guys, if that's okay. Essentially, what I want you to do is I want you to riff off what you're working on at the moment as a way of getting us started this afternoon. Um, I, uh, I'm obviously going to be a very light touch chair, but um, what, what I would like us to do, like us trying to, to try and do over the next hour, um, is to touch three key bases. Um, I'd like to talk, us to talk a little bit about use cases. I'd like us to step back and think a little bit about the why of this kind of development. Um, what is it? What is the policy case for the restructuring of international financial transfers? What is it about the status quo that makes if anything, a compelling argument for revisiting some of the fundamentals for how we do things like invoice trade, uh, for example. I want us to think a little bit about um, some of the legal and technical issues. Clearly, uh, when you are talking about uh, international transfers of this kind, we have important questions of legal uh, compatibility, practical compatibility, um, the practicalities of interlinkage that I would like us to touch on. We have some great case studies, of course, already out there, of which... Uh, I think all of the members of the panel have been involved in some way, whether we're talking about Dura or Enbridge. Um, I'd like us to draw some lessons from those if we can. And then inevitably, I'd like us to think a little bit about um, the politics and obviously the geopolitics uh, of this question. Um, we have the very dry term up there, regulation. Uh, of course, when you're talking about international transfers, the line between regulation and politics dissolves completely. Um, and I would like us to, well, no, it becomes more, more permeable. Let's put it that way, maybe. I'd like us to think a little bit about that. I'd like us to put this problem in a geopolitical context um, explicitly. Um, as always, of course, uh, there'd be ample opportunity for questions. I would encourage you, as the panellists start to unpack their thinking, to start thinking about how you would like to then unpick that thinking um, once they're finished. Um, and I'll make sure that there's plenty of chance for questions. But what I'd like to do, just by way of starting, is to ask each panel member to spend six, seven, eight minutes, uh, just setting the scene for us a little bit, like I say, drawing on your, your work, uh, ideally, giving us your take on this question of why we find ourselves having this discussion and where it might go next, and giving everybody a sense of how to think about that debate and its practical implications once they leave the room in an hour. So, Michael, maybe I can, I can start with you. Yeah, okay. Um, well, my, my interest is reflected in uh, a book that I've just published, um, digital the central bank currencies, the future of money. Uh, it's on Amazon all good at the moment. Bookshops, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I've been embroiled in this for the last the last year and a half, um, as well as helping to organise the conference. Um, and I'm I'm a monetary economist, but I'm also extremely interested in geopolitics. Um, and so those are my the two areas come together when we're looking at digital currencies in the future. And I want very much in what I'm going to present later on uh, to look at the future, the future possibility uh, in terms of trade and financial transfers. Oh, okay. So we'll do, we'll do some quick introductions then, Michael. We'll go back to you. Back to, back to, yeah. yeah. So, Osman, please, if you could just introduce yourself. Yeah. Good. Hello. Hello. Um, my name is Usman Mandeng. Um, I work mostly with Accenture and co lead at CBDC campaign globally. I've been involved in a number of um, key CBDC projects, including e Jura, Coca2, Embridge, 
We're advising the ECB on the digital euro. So I've done this for the last four and a half years. I'm an economist by training. And the convergence between fintech, macroeconomics, the foundation of payments um, has been for me a fantastic experience. And I hope to share some of the insights with you uh, later on. Thank, Thank you. you. Great. Diego, please. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> so my name is Diego Valionosio. I'm a, a senior associate here at Clifford Chance. And I am one of the lawyers that spearheads our fintech proposition. And in that context, I have been lucky enough to work with BIS. I'm doing some work for, with them on, on currently Project Sela. Um, I'm also doing some work um, on a consortium, as part of a consortium that's implementing CBDCs in the UAE. That's now public, published uh, recently. Um, and so I've been thinking about the legal aspects of introducing CBDCs into any financial framework. Um, and in my view, that sort of takes account of two big things. On the one hand, it's you know, how do you create a, the valid powers of a central bank to actually do the issuance and, and operate the platform that, that will apply for the CBDCs. And then on the other hand, you've got the question of how do you integrate it into the wider financial system. Um, and in that context, it's quite handy. Uh, I've been a financial services regulatory lawyer for a long time. And so have a sense of what financial institutions think about and what they need from a legal certainty perspective in order to adopt a new means, new means of payment. Um, you know, how that would impact on financial services transactions, um, typical products, you know, repos and, and other uses of securities with a, with a digital payment element. Um, and so that's, that's sort of my focus area and why I'm talking today. Brilliant. Okay. So a, a legal expert, very much a practical design expert by the sounds of things, among other things, as many, and <clears throat> Michael, someone who spent a lot of time thinking about geopolitics. Michael, why don't you get us started? Um, yep. give, us a, give us a preview of your book. Yeah, well, I'm not going to do that. That, <laughs> that, that would take far too long. Uh, so I, I want to make it a fairly, fairly brief presentation. Uh, but in a sense, the presentation concentrates on one of the chapters uh, in my book, which is the uh, international dimension. Um, everybody knows that the world is changing. The global economy is changing. The balance of the global economy is changing. Um, the power structures in terms of economics and trade are also changing. Um, what is happening, though, beneath that kind of global surface level is the increasing, increasing regionalization of trade. Now, in fact, of course, trade has always been regional, um, which was the mistake of Brexit, of course, not to recognize that, that our main trading nation, <laughs> trading area, uh, was, was the European Union or the rest of the European Union. Well, we're learning that mistake in the UK. But there is this increasingly regionalization of trade going beyond that immediate geographical contiguity. Um, and there is rapid developing trade across Asia. And that there is little doubt. Um, and that's leading to other kinds of cooperation, monetary cooperation, political cooperation, economic cooperation, as well as simply trade as far as Asia is concerned. Um, and indeed, the initial um, suggested external role for the digital one, the ECNY, um, was, was very much in using it, using the digital one, uh, as a, a, a currency for use by at least three countries uh, in terms of trade within uh, that area of Asia, Southeast Asia. Um, there were internal reasons as well. They wanted to deal with the monopoly of uh, Alipay and WePay, um, who were um, uh, making quite a lot of money out of commissioning payment structure across China, um, but all the risks were being taken by the commercial banks. Um, and not surprisingly, the Chinese uh, government system did not wish that to uh, uh, be maintained. At least they could uh, envisage that CBDCs would challenge it. But in terms of its external use, um, in 2014, that was one of the suggestions, that it could be used to not just purely bilateral trade with China, but groups of bilateral trade, if you like, small groups, um, that could actually 
use the digital one as the trading currency. Um, now that um, means that when, when you start looking at that idea of digital currency areas, then uh, what I think you can envisage is that this could be quite a significant uh, development, the idea of extended regional uh, digital currency areas. And not just in terms of um, Southeast Asia, or for that matter, if you're talking about China, then Africa as well. And then if you look at, look, look at the idea of the BRICS, then there's another dimension to it as well. But not that. But if you think about it, I mean, the digital <coughs> euro, if one is established, um, and that probably means when it's established, but it's not absolutely certain, um, then you're looking at the single European payments area. So it's not just the euro area. It's a single European payments area, which is 36 countries including the UK, although I'm not sure the UK would be happy about using a digital euro. Um, but you can see the idea, that the, the idea of in trading, for trading purposes, and the financing of trade, um, the majority of which, of course, is done in dollars. I mean, but it's not a huge majority. I mean, some 40% um, of trade invoicing is done uh, in um, in US dollars. But um, so the, the, there is this potential, certainly in relation to trade invoicing, of developing digital currency areas that would ease the transfer of payments uh, within those extended digital currency areas. Now, I'm not saying this is going to happen, but this is something that we need to be looking at and regu regulators obviously need to be looking at as well. Um, because it's not just crypto that needs to be regulated. We do need regulations governing for a variety of reasons, which Diego will go into. We need regulations to deal with, with um, uh, 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 CBDCs yeah. used for cross-border payment. And although, in, although most of the effort has <coughs> gone in, in terms of cross-border payments, the experimentation by... Uh, the BIS and various projects and, and others not, not, doesn't always involve the BIS um, uh, you know, has, has tended to look at wholesale CBDCs um, and the RGTS system how that could be involved um, but I, I think the, 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 that, so that, that, that has been the main sort of uh, interest in terms of cross-border payments and the use of CBDCs. But of course, if you think about it in terms of, I say, these extended digital currency areas, then there's another dimension to, to that. Um, now, in a sense, the impact of the potential of digital currency areas, extended digital currency, large digital currency areas, you know, an area... For, for the digital one, an area for the digital euro, an area for the digital dollar. If the Americans eventually decide that they want some sort of digital, uh, some central bank digital currency, which I think they will in terms of cross-border trading. Retail, no, I think that, that's, that, that, that may, may be a little way off, particularly in the US. Um, but these issues... Uh, well, the issue of uh, digital currency areas, extended ones, um, is emphasised by the fact these will be launched in what is an interconnected world. Um, and one that um, uh, expresses the need for financial stability across that world. Now, in fact, the monetary system which we have at the moment, and I've written a a paper on challenging the, the, uh, challenging the dollar. Um, not that I think the dollar, US dollar is going to disappear as a pivotal element in the global monetary system. It won't disappear anytime soon. We're talking about decades. Um, but as you, but the, the system is a hierarchical system. Sometimes I think people imagine that, that, uh, that, that it's a kind of... Um, 
you know, a, a sort of equal system where currencies simply are used, different currencies used and trading occurs. But in fact, the system is maintained by the US dollar and maintained by the um, Federal Reserve Bank um, as a hierarchical system. The Federal Reserve Bank acts effectively as a global central bank, um, which is helpful because otherwise the system would collapse. And that's been strengthened since the global financial crisis with considerable number of um, swap, uh, credit swap, uh, currency swap arrangements. The C6, which is six major banks, including the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England and, and the ECB, etc. Um, and the Swiss Bank, for that matter. Um, and Japan, which is the outlier in the sense that, you know, in, in some ways, um, that has also been extended by temporary swap arrangements, credit currency swap arrangements, with something like 14 other central banks. So you can see the system is constructed in such a way that the role of the um, uh, Federal Reserve is, is extreme, extremely important. It's, it, it really is pivotal. <coughs> Problem is, it also has its own domestic interest. So the, 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 this is the international system into which we may see uh, extended digital currency areas moving. So what will happen? Well, the potential, I think, there is to decrease the invoicing of trade, the 40% invoicing of trade that the US dollar uh, inhabits at the moment, and probably an increase in the ECNY, the Digital one as a trade invoicing currency. It will not challenge the dollar in terms of its reserve position. That uh, uh, certainly not not any time soon. When I say not any time soon, let's take three decades for us now. Although predicting the future is always difficult, it might happen more quickly. But um, so that 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 really is is is, is the issue. Um, the, the impact of these wider digital currency areas um, using CBDCs effectively um, or one country's CBDCs across other monetary jurisdictions, which is enormously challenging. Um, and, but it's not that challenging when it comes to invoicing trade. So that, I think, the implications then and we'll look at that perhaps in the next session as to what, what that might mean in the more distant future. But for the moment, I think the idea of um, an increased invoicing of trade by particularly the ECNY, the digital one, is likely to happen. Michael, as an economist, I'm going to ask you to indulge me a slightly simplified question, and we'll come back to this, I'm sure. But quick answer, what, are, what in your mind are the key features of an optimal digital currency area for wholesale cross-border transactions? In, in, it's interesting you posed it in that way because uh, presumably you're referring <coughs> to the notion that we already have, well, we're supposed to have, things like optimal currency That's areas. That's why I phrase it that way. And the EU is nominally an optical... I don't believe in... As an economist, I don't believe in optimal currency areas. I, th I think it's a bit of a, it's a mirage, a myth, really. Uh, it's just that we trade geographically, and therefore there is always an in incentive to, to actually develop some monetary system right. linked to that. Okay. Um, so I, th I think that's my answer. But the d point about digital space, as opposed to geographical space, is it global. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the difference. So digital currency area, very different to an optimal Currency, yeah. Absolutely. Although presumably what's feasible here is in part going to be a mix of both the incentive signals sent by the underlying patterns of trade, but of course also the, yes. the willingness and the trust of the jurisdictions involved. Okay, Usman, if I can come to you next. Mm. Um, so Michael's kicked us off there with a sense of um, the context in which this debate's emerging and what some of the big picture incentives might be to make this work. You've been involved in a series of projects designed to work out how to make it work. Um, let's start from there. Tell us a little okay. bit about your work and give us something to chew on. Very good, very good. Um, look, I, I met uh, with a group of students I'm tutoring at the, at the London School of Economics this morning, and we, they're working on a CBDC project, and they asked precisely 
the question, how would CBDC change anything, actually? And, and, and we seem to be saying something that, on the one hand, CBDC is just another format of money, right? On the other hand, we seem to be saying it is going to solve a lot of the problems that we have been having for a long time. And the question is, why, why would that be? You just change, you just adopt a new format, which is a, to a token form of money compared with what we call scriptural money, which is book entry money, and uh, physical tokens, which are banknotes. You know, why would it, that in itself make any difference, you see? So I think CBDC has to be seen in a broader context. What, what, did, you, what did you say? Well, I said, <laughs> look, if you really want to make a difference, one key element you need to change, which is access to central bank money. Right. Okay, so central bank <clears> money <throat> is extremely local. It's very local. It's only distributed to local banks. For non-residents, yeah. And it is only typically available for non-residents, although you know, banknotes obviously circulate widely. The large trolley payment system is only typically used by resident financial institutions. So it's a very, very narrow system. If you really want to change, and this is true in particular for, financial, for international financial transactions, then we need to change access. So it's a combination of central banks being willing to give access to a broader group of users, and then the features that the tokens provide that allow us to do transactions, I would say, more efficiently and you know, add additional features where we can you know, um, perform uh, use cases which are easily, uh, given the out-of-the-box nature uh, of a token-based system, compared with, with what we have today. But, but I, I think I'd like us to sort of, that, that should serve us as reference. If we wanted to change it, and if all the debate we have about CBDC, it is a combination of a change in access policy and a new medium. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then what else did I say? Well, then I say, look, then what is interesting about the token-based nature, you know, and, and it's about all the peer-to-peer -peer nature of how these networks that are typically relying on some form of blockchain or other DLT type infrastructures. The peer-to-peer -peer network, we move from a highly intermediated system with long payment chains to one which is peer-to-peer. -peer, you know. Basically what we're trying to do is replicating a cash transaction um, in the digital space. Where in cash we need to be in physical proximity with one another, and you know, with these digital tokens we can be conducting these transactions irrespective, and we typically say irrespective of space and time. Now we can do that any time we want. Okay, that that's really a key feature. Then we have some additional add-ons, programmability, etc., traceability, which are <coughs> which are really really nice. Um, but then the bottom line is still efficiency. Can we do transactions more cheaply? than the current system today. And, and the big, of course, debate about international payments is they're very costly, they're opaque, they take a long time. So for CBDC to really have a dent, it would have to be much better at doing these transactions. And in a peer-to-peer -peer network, typically where transactions can be instant, probably CBDC can do that. And, and we have demonstrated that in a number of projects, actually. So let me, just in the inter interest of time, I, I refer to um, sort of two projects that we um, have been conducting together with the BIS Innovation Hub. The first one, Jura, with the Central Bank of France and the Central Bank of Switzerland. Here the idea was to use CBDC in an international setting to do foreign exchange transactions and to settle um, a tokenized security on, on chain. I should say it was a commercial paper, not a security, but a commercial paper on chain. And what we have been doing is, when we started the project, we asked the Banque de France, we started with the Banque de France, and we asked, look, if you really want to change international payments, you need to give access to foreigners, non-residents in the sense of the balance of payment. So I'm coming back to the earlier point I mentioned. You know. And they considered it and said yes. And that for us was the starting point, to really envisage a completely new in uh, infrastructure on how international payments could be conducted. Okay. So if, uh, and, and maybe to appreciate it, how conduct payments are conducted today, right? When you do an international payments today, say, you know, you're banking with, uh, say, Lloyds, and you want to send money to uh, someone in, let's say, in Washington, D.C., okay? Then the, the payment would go from Lloyds to its correspondent, probably in London, Barclays, right? And Barclays would probably send it to its correspondent in New York, probably City. City New York would then send it to the beneficiary bank in Washington, D.C. Okay, so long payment chains, everyone is adding fees, time, delays, etc. Yeah? Now, some will argue we can do it much better today, but that's in principle is how it, 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 it is how it works. Now. With CBDC, it's like sending a text message. So you send it from your, you know, from your wallet effectively, um, or let's say your bank will send it um, to another to the beneficiary bank. Okay, very short, very quick, and and and, and transparent, and probably much much cheaper. In foreign exchange, it's even um, more important that we because we are doing two transactions, right? We we are paying and we are receiving a currency, right? And if we can pay and receive the currency instantly and in what we call atomically, meaning both transactions have to succeed um, for the trade to hold or both fail, right? 
we create effectively a completely riskless um, trading environment. Okay. Now, in Jura, that's what we have done. So we had French banks being able to receive Swiss franc CBDC, and we had Swiss banks receiving French, uh, no, Euro, Euro CBDC. And, and the transaction um, for foreign exchange was conducted in an instant and atomic fashion, right? So the key is the payment is the settlement, right? Well, today, and, sorry, I'm going to repeat myself, but today we have in payments four, type, four transactions. The discharge of the obligation, clearing, netting, and settlement. Okay. With a token, you receive, you take delivery of the token, the trade, the payment execution is a settlement. Okay. So that's a, a big advantage. Then we issued a commercial paper on chain, so a, a tokenized commercial paper, and then we allowed that paper to be purchased. So we issued it in France under French regulation. By the way, this was not a regulatory sandbox, so we operated within the regulatory environment. We issued the commercial paper in France on chain. We then allowed a Swiss bank to pay for it in Switzerland in Swiss franc. Okay? So from the point of view of the Banque de France, an offshore transaction in euros was never done before. Okay? And for the Swiss bank, the, sorry, for the French bank, the seller of the commercial paper, the certainty to receive in exchange central bank money right, um, for selling the commercial paper. So basically we've replicated conditions that today hold in a domestic setting to the international setting. Right? So we change, we call it, we change the geography of central bank money, right? because the, 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 this, um, this uh, amazing feature we have that the only thing that is local today is money when everything else, goods and services are global. Right? <laughs> so we are, we are making money global. Okay? We're making it portable. You know, you can buy a, you can, you can, you can manufacture a car in the, in the, in the UK, you can send it to Japan and people can drive around and do whatever they want. Okay. With money, they can't do that. Right. But, you know, we are doing something that will go, it will make money more like a goods and, and, and service. Okay. Just one wait, quickly on, on Embridge. Embridge is a, also a fantastic program. We're just now <coughs> moving into the next, its next phase. It's with four central banks. This, uh, People's Bank of China, Hong Kong Monetary Authority, Bank of Thailand, and the UAE Central Bank. It's to create a settlement corridor where all the four central banks provide their CBDC to the commercial bank's participant in the corridor to allow them to exchange, to settle international payments, the four currencies. Okay? So again, it's the peer-to-peer -peer nature which makes this really, you know, really, really novel, right? And it's the fact that um, you can settle in central bank money, which means it's, it's very, very safe. An additional ambition is we are using, of course, the local currencies for settling international payments. So um, Michael said earlier the dollar is dominance, right? These countries typically, these four, when they exchange goods and services, they typically pay in dollars, right? They invoice and pay in dollars. No? We want to make it more attractive to use their own currencies yeah. in order to reduce reliance on a third-party currency. So it is therefore, Enbridge is, an, it, it, it is interesting, it's a new architecture, it's the use of local currencies, and it's the use of central bank money to make it extremely safe to transact. Okay? okay. Let me stop here. Yeah, good. No, brilliant. Um, okay, quick fire question. Uh, give us our talking points. What is the one thing we should take away from the Enbridge pilot? What is the one thing we should take away from the Jura pilot? Okay, so the one Give us our water cooler chair. <laughs> I think, you know, Enbridge is announcing a completely new setting for conducting international payments in local currency. I think that's, that's what it is. And I think to some extent, Jura was the pioneer in that critical combination of a change in access policy <coughs> and the new medium that allows us to build a completely new architecture on, on how payments could be made. Brilliant. Okay. Um, obviously, we'll come back to that if people have got questions about Jura or Enbridge. Uh, stow them away. Um, but for now, um, okay, Diego, inevitably, at some point, we have to come down to some of the legal questions, the interoperability questions, the interlinkage questions, the compatibility questions. Um, this is something you know as well as anybody. Um, pick up from where Michael and Osman have, have started us off and just talk us through some of the the wiring and plumbing questions from a legal perspective of how sure. you make this interlinkage work. Sure. So th there, are two, there are two aspects which I alluded to when I started talking about this. The, the first one is, you know, are there adequate powers at the central bank to issue the relevant CBDC? Now that's very easy in a domestic framework because you can obviously um, simply create 
um, your your legal framework. Write the law, yeah. You, you write the laws, you yeah. say, like, central bank of this particular country is allowed to issue CBDCs, no problem. You, when you start integrating systems, you then have the question of, well, what about the CBDCs that have been issued somewhere else? Um, would they settle transactions in, in our jurisdiction? And this is a question of legal tender. So is, you know, is the CBDC recognized as legal tender? And should it be recognized as, as legal tender? Most jurisdictions will take the view that they don't want that. They don't want external CBDCs to actually be able to extinguish debt obligations in their jurisdiction. Why? Because it takes away um, <clears throat> your ability to govern your, your monetary policy to an extent. You're giving away some of that, of that um, autonomy and sovereignty. And so, you know, the, the, from a legal perspective, uh, the position is, well, you, you shouldn't make other CBDCs legal tender. So how do you marry it up? And, and you know, that's the fascinating point when you start thinking about these integration models. Um, you need a way in which you can actually uh, facilitate um, an exchange of one currency for the other without necessarily giving up um, autonomy and, and uh, uh, sovereignty between the central banks that are operating in this. So if you've got multiple cor corridors like, like Enbridge, um, you know, the way it's been solved so far is you, you sort of start, start giving away slithers of the platform. You say, like, this is the bit that you control central bank A, this is the bit that you control central bank B, uh, and you start sort of getting to a position where everybody in that framework trusts each other, and that trust then creates this ability to recognize the payment on the other side. And because you've got a strong uh, validator, which is the central bank that sits in the middle, that allows the, the commerce in the local jurisdiction to also ad adopt it. And this takes me to the second point that's important, which is <clears throat> you need legal certainty um, at the level of the, the trading sector that a payment that's being made or, that's, or any, any export that's being made is actually going to get is valid and binding and that you're going to get the money that you've been promised. That's fundamentally the point that you're trying to achieve. And in order to achieve that, you need to be able to enforce payments in this, in this, in this new infrastructure. That's the, that's the fundamental question. Now, how you do that, either you do it because you make um, actors that participate on the, on the corridor or platform subject to a set of contractual arrangements that you can then, and here it's, it, it gets really tricky, that you can enforce in every jurisdiction in which that platform operates so that you've got the ability to do this, or you create some sort of delegated dispute resolution mechanism which sort of sits on top of everyone and, and, and decides the disputes. But, but fundamentally, you need a way in which you can enforce payment obligations and extinguish debts. Um, and here, you, you, you get into, into even trickier situations, depending on the type of goods that you're trading and who the trading participants are. Um, Usman has been talking about, <clears throat> you know, in the, current, in the current rails, there are um, lots of steps that you take in order to, to, to finalize the, the payment. You've got netting arrangements, you've got clearing arrangements. You know, you've got this concept of settlement finality that will kick in at some point um, depending on the payment for, um, system that you're using. Now, all of these concepts don't exist because we want to be inefficient. They exist because um, businesses require the legal certainty that they give you. So to give you the, the example in respect of <clears throat> the clearing, it's in, in order to get offset counterparty risk. You, you, you use clearing primarily for that purpose. You use netting in order to be able to, to get to a net amount in order to settle your obligations. So that facilitates you not having to hold lots of liquidity that you would require in the gross. Um, and so on. So every step of the, of the chain, settlement finality, this, this concept of settlement finality, exists so that the payment becomes irrevocable in the insolvency of the, of the, of the system. And so on. And, and so essentially you've got a whole set of uh, legal fail-safes, if you want, that have been baked into the system and may appear as inefficiencies, but are there in order to grant certainty. So the question for lawyers is, can, can you, is it okay to rely on the technology and this idea, for example, of, of atomic settlement, does that therefore negate the requirement for settlement finality? 
because if it's set this automatically, your exposure time to the counterparty is virtually right. zero. Yeah. And so, you know, maybe you can you can get comfortable that actually you, you don't need it. Why why do you need um, settlement finality at that point, or or why do you need to be able to to net the obligations? Makes no sense. Um, and and here you fall back on the system only works efficiently if everybody trusts each other. And I think in the financial services space and the regulatory assessment that, that you know, governments do, they, they, they force you to think about uh, fail situations. They force you to think about instances where the, the, the system does not go smoothly. And so the, it's very difficult to, to try and persuade a regulator to give away some of these very embedded fail-safes that exist. And so where you end up is you have to then recreate them within these novel frameworks. Mm -hmm. And that requires, again, some level of giving away some of your legal um, power as a central bank or as a government um, to recognize, for example, that the settlement will be final even in the insolvency of somebody in another jurisdiction. And things like that. So, so you, you start um, asking yourself questions that require um, international law to settle them, which you didn't have before. Yeah. And, and I think for financial institutions that are trading on, on, these, on these platforms, it's not a question of, oh, well, why can't they just be more pragmatic? It's a question of requirement. They are required by their regulators to take a risk-averse position Absolutely. because they're handling other people's money. <laughs> And so, yeah. you know, you need that legal it's, it's, it's clarity. Like, it's like any debate about difference. Uh, it goes straight onto very sensitive ter territory. Yes. Yeah. And you need that legal certainty in order to achieve this efficiency. And that's what we're sort of trying to achieve, I think. Um, we're not there yet, but we're working hard to getting it. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the two points you've made there, one about the, the, the need for a dispute resolution mechanism, the other about the need essentially to be willing to extend an element of deference, whether it's around... Uh, settlement finality or anything else. I mean, that raises the question, maybe I'll just ask this as a question, which is, to what extent do you think it's inherent in the design of these kinds of systems that jurisdictions have to get comfortable with giving away an element of sovereignty? Is this a sovereignty problem or not? Um, I think it is insofar any integration is a, is, is a sovereignty question. Yeah. Any sort of integration requires parties to try to trust each other and, and give away a little bit of their of their sovereignty. That's how it works. That's how the EU works ultimately, of right? And so I think yes, it, it, it is. I think you know, and this is where geopolitics becomes really interesting, because right. you know, at, at what level and, and with whom are you comfortable entering into these sorts of arrangements? And what if <coughs> ten years down the line, you know, your 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 participant decides to take a very different political position to yours? what's your ability to control that, roll back? Um, you know, the more you integrate, the harder it is to roll back, as we're seeing. And do you think these platforms necessarily <clears throat> need an element of centralised governments, or will it be possible to run them on an entirely decentralised basis? I think you can run them decentralised. I mean, there, there can be decentralisation from a technology perspective. I think that's slightly different, though. Um, because the political consensus needs to sit about that. Exactly. Yeah, I get it. Right. Yeah. Great. Um, actually, maybe I can just ask you, uh, uh, um, Diego makes the very, it seems to me, absolutely salient point there, which is that however we might conceptualise these systems, they will first and foremost appear in the interlinking of groups of states that trust each other in a very profound way. What does the Dura and Embridge experience tell us about that dimension. Why was it those groups ultimately of participants who were able to do this first mover, this first mover step? Yeah. And can I ask if people can start thinking about questions once this minute's finished? Well, yeah. Look, the, 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 the trust issue. I, I, I see things a little bit different than you do, but you know, you see it from a legal point of view. There is a trust issue. I think the fact that we have France and Switzerland, you know, working together on this project, yeah, it wasn't France it's not and a coincidence. Mongolia or so, right. <laughs> okay, so there is something there, yeah. But, you see, if you, if you take a step back and if you look at financial markets, right, you can buy a U.S. Treasury bond, whoever you are, wherever you are, right, you just buy it. Right? The only thing you cannot buy wherever you are is, is, is Federal Reserve money, okay. So... It's not that we, we have today a structure in place where we can acquire any financial asset wherever you, and whoever we are. Okay? So we then accept the conditions under which the 
the, um, the transfer of ownership will be conducted by whoever is the custodian of that asset. But, you know, uh, we, we already have a structure like this today. We just don't have it for what we call money, okay? But we have it effectively for what are very near money type instruments like, you know, treasury bills, etc. Okay, so that I think is also an important um, perspective. Yeah. And then there is. But that, that is in part the case because, for better or worse, for whatever reason, the US authorities have learned to live with a very large pool of offshore no, holdings but, of dollars. No, but it's not only the US, you can buy a German government bond, you can buy a. Well, a but most you know, modern but, states but, have. And I think it's because the, the, the government allows you to. I mean, of I course. think that's the point, right? This, and, and you only get it through a chain of intermediaries that you trust. But, but the, key, the key argument is here, and this is what, what changes with money. Who should be allowed to hold central bank money? Right? The, 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 yeah. And then under what conditions? And then sovereignty, etc. If our government allows anyone to hold our debt, why shouldn't our central bank allow anyone to hold our money? Right? I mean, it's, it's a normative sort of question. Okay? So that, that, that's one aspect. The other is, is sovereignty, and sovereignty is used a lot in the work we're doing. I wonder sometimes if it's not a bit of a stretch, right? Is there a loss of sovereignty if foreigners are using your currency? Why should there be, right? It's very likely these foreigners will be as sensitive to monetary policy impulses as your domestic agents, right? There's nothing to assume because they are foreigners that they, you know, may undermine the transmission of your monetary policy, for example. So I think, you know, I, I don't... No, you're right, it's a, load, it's a loaded term. I, I should have used something closer <laughs> to Diego's description, essentially, of the willingness to give away an element of absolute regulatory discretion, which is, that, that, that's not quite sovereignty in the way that it's... Okay, yeah. but, but look, and then another aspect is legal tender, right? I know we had the discussion, legal tender. In the UK, right, Bank of England notes are only legal tender in England and Wales, right? Not in Scotland and not in Northern Ireland, okay? And yet, no one cares, because for conducting payments, we are all pragmatic, right? We use what we can use without asking too many questions. So again, the legal tender is an old concept from the 19th century. I think it's a... Sorry to say that. Not wrong. Completely overblown. I think it's a red herring, right? Um, we, we, we don't need the notion of legal tender. Uh, it's, it was given to us as insurance that this is paper money, but it's actually legal tender, you know, compared with gold coins when we introduced paper money in the 19th century. We don't need the concept today. And it's irrelevant, I think. Allow me to give you one interesting historical parallel, because when you said, and when Michael mentioned this extension of digital currency areas, right? I, th I think this is really an exciting sort of area. Again, there's nothing inherent why digital currencies can do it, if not existing currencies could not also do it. But we had in the 19th century already um, parallel currencies, meaning currencies like, for example, in the German custom union, uh, customs union in the 19th century, you had the German states had their currencies, and then there were the custom unions coins that could also be used and were recognized as legal tender in the different states for conducting international payments. Okay. Very famously, the Maria Theresa Thaler. I recently got an email from someone in Saudi Arabia who said, Usman, do you want to buy 10 billion of Maria Theresa Thaler? These are 18th century silver coins issued in Austria, where they have been demonetized for a long time. Right? If I wanted to buy them for $11 a piece, which would be $11 billion, which I don't quite have, but what is exciting, the Maria Theresa Thaler was a silver coin that was used as legal tender throughout the Middle East, throughout Eastern Africa. Again, a parallel currency. Okay. And I think before we think about CBDC as being a substitution of national currencies, I think we should think of it as maybe a parallel currency that can serve for certain transactions, complementing where national currencies may see their boundaries mm -hmm. and therefore serve us you know, in, a, in, a, in a different context. Maybe I Makes sense. Michael, do you want to jump in? I agree with the money about, um, about the issue of legal tender. I think it, it, it's almost irrelevant. The IMF actually raised it in one of their papers, and I, I thought it was mm -hmm. almost meaningless. It, it, yeah, it really isn't. It's, uh, however, the uh, point about sovereignty is interesting. Uh, it's all right saying, I mean, sovereignty is a slippery concept. Um, and it's something that um, you, you, you suggest is not that important. I think for most people these days it's become extremely important because we live in an era geopolitically of um, sovereign nation states, all 220 of them, even though 120 of those have less than 5 million inhabitants. 
People sometimes, I think, forget the structure of the world economy. I mean, there's some obviously big economies like China and India, and then some medium-sized economies like the US. We won't, <laughs> we won't thank you for saying that. <laughs> uh, and, and Brazil. But um, so sovereignty is a problem. The interesting thing about the digital currency areas is that it's quite possible now, given where we are, that all of the 220 countries will want a CBDC and they want to protect their sovereignty. But in fact, the, the, the countries which um, ought to feel uh, more threatened is ones that do have, and that probably doesn't include many of the 120 small countries, uh, that do have some uh, uh, well-balanced well monetary and fiscal policy. The ones that don't, and a lot of countries that don't, you, you, in, in one sense, it doesn't really matter. Um, and they are likely, I think, to be willing to surrender whatever that sovereignty is uh, in terms of an efficient trading system. So I think that, that's my best guess. And what will happen, happen uh, in, in an evolutionary context?